is a Ramadan. And when you have Psalm or Ramadan, what is the superiority act? Mondays and Thursdays or any other days you want to fast? 13, 14, 15 days. So therefore, every act that is obligatory, it comes with a superiority act. It comes with a sunnah act. And why is that there? Because Allah with your nose that man can easily become ritualistic. So now those extra actions now will help to engender Islam in you to where it really becomes a way of life for you. Where you're praying when you don't have to pray. That's why the best prayers after the five is what? It's to hudge it. Because now to wake up and forsake your bed at a time when you don't have to. At a time when the nefs have a natural desire to want to stay in the bed and you get up from your sleep. To pray in the middle of the night, you get really great rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now that is a, a way of, of making an assessment of the sincerity of your practice. When you can do things in the way of Allah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's no obligation to do it. Now, it's able to, now you're able to see the reality. There's a story of a man who at the time of death, I don't know if any one of you or anyone who's experienced watching someone die. They go in and out. And I've watched many people, they go in and out. They begin sometimes to hallucinate. And that's why it's very important that we work hard on our iman. And this is a very good topic. Because as I mentioned yesterday, you can't go to the pharmaceutical company or, or the pharmacist and ask them for some pills of iman. And say, look, I want three pills. I've been low in my iman. Can you give me three pills you know, of, of taqwa? You know, throw it down and now I'm strong. No, it takes time. You have to work on it. And you have to be careful because at the time of death, shaitan comes at you with his last shot at the time of death. There was a man who at the time of death, because what, how you live is how you die. Understand this. How you live is how you will die, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. So now, whatever you're involved in, if your whole thing is March Madness, NCAA, or just basketball, the NBA championship, now here comes death. And the people around you are saying, say, lay down the law, lay down the law, lay down the law. And what you said, Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say, lay down the law, LeBron James. <laughs> he hit 40 yesterday. <laughs> you don't want to be in that situation. There was a man who used to play chess so much that when they was telling him, say, lay down the law, lay down the law, you know what he was saying? Checkmate. <laughs> Check me. That's crazy. So how you live is how you will die. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in the Ladina Paul Rabbun Allah who must the Kamu. To the Nazan wa alayhim al Malaika and let the Khafu will let the Hazanu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that those who say that our Lord is Allah through Mastaqamu and then after that they are upright. After that, then they perform those deeds. They are committed. They make a commitment. Now understand that when it says you are upright, it doesn't mean you don't commit sins, you don't make mistakes. It's just that first and foremost, when you say Allah Rabbana, that Allah is our Lord through Mr. Thamu, that means that you have made a commitment. Your near, your motivation is to do that which Allah has commanded you to do. So therefore, in your struggles in trying to fulfill this commitment, you fall, you get back up. You fall, you get back up. But Allah Azza wa Jal knows that you're making a sincere effort to do so. So Allah Azza wa Jal says at the time of death, that at the time of death, the angels that have always been with you in this dunya, they are right there with you. The Prophet said when a man dies, the angel is there telling him, let the khaf, let the hazan, don't fear, nor agree. So here there's a story because the angel said, We were your friends in, in the life of this world, and we are your friends also in the next. So that brings solace to the soul of the one who's now in Sakalatul Mot, the delirium of moat, of, 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 of death. 
that when death is there, it's a frightening thing. Why? Because this is the first experience. You know that this is your last chance. You get ready to cross that threshold to the unseen realm of world. Everybody, well, I lived in the inner city. I grew up in the Chicago ghettos. And there was a lot of madness going on. People involved in drugs, gambling, gang banging, the whole nine yards. But wallahi, no matter how preoccupied people were in all sorts of folly and foolishness, whenever someone was killed, it stopped everybody and everybody would kind of congregate and just look. Everybody's involved. Nobody cares nothing about nothing. But the sooner somebody gets killed, everybody looks. Because death still is a phenomenon. It is an unprecedented phenomenon among men that it even stops the person that's really offering crack, offering to heroin, whatever. But he looks and says, man, wow. I was just talking to him yesterday. John. Oh, he's dead. <laughs> And I sat and I used to watch the people and say, wow, they still are puzzled with death because it is a shocking reality. So here the angel said, not the harmful. Don't fear. Don't fear what? It brings solace to the mormon, to the believer. Don't fear what's coming in front of you. Why? Because you're getting ready to get Jannah. Allah is going to protect you. Allah is going to help you. We were your friends in this dunya and in the next life. Well, that doesn't. And don't fear and don't grieve. Don't grieve at what? Or your money, your children, your what? Everything you leave. Because this is what people of, of the dunya, people of this world, when death seems to approach them, they begin to think about their parents and their, uh, their, 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 their children and their wealth and their investments. No, the believers thinking about, man, I hope that Allah is with jelly. Forgives me. I hope that Allah will jail and have mercy on me. This is the believer because he knows he's getting ready to go to Allah. He doesn't care about what he's leaving because Allah will jail has this. So it goes on to say in a tradition that a man, in the part of death, his children were around him. So when he would go out and he would come back in, he said, Ya Laytani, Kamila. And then he'd go back out. And then he'd come back. And his family is listening. He said, Ya Laytani, Ba'ida. And then he goes back out. And then he came back. He said, Ya Laytani, Jadid. And then he died. Cut that. So the people were very concerned about, man, what is this? What did he mean? Why did he say, Ya Laytani, Kamila? Ya Laytani, Ba'ida. Ya Laytani, Jadid. Whoa. Because Kamila means woe that it was all. And woe that it was far. And woe that I, it was new. Late to me, Jadeen. They didn't understand what this meant. Woe to me. It was new. So Jibreel and Aysanah went to the Prophet and they were suddenly and already informed him. And this is one of the greatest netmas of those that lived during the time of the Prophet and Aysanah. Because sometimes they could just go to him and get what it is that they needed to get. You all, unfortunately, y'all got people like me and Muhammad Shraib and other scholars that we know nothing. <laughs> Something happened to you, we have no idea. So anyway, they go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he already knew. And they say, Ya Rasulullah. They say, our father was dying, and he said, Ya Laytani Kamila, Ya Laytani Ba'ida, Ya Laytani Jadida. He said, we have no idea what this means. He said, I'll tell you, Jabril, let me know. He said that while he was dying, and he went into that little rim, that little part, just before you go to the Barzakh, he said the angels were there telling him not to call food, not to ask, knew, don't fear nor grieve. And so they showed him the picture of Jannah, a Jannah that he was going to get. And so when he looked at it, he said, Ya Allah, lina nalika, oh Allah, whose is this? Whose is that? And Allah told him, he said, it is yours. The angel said, this is yours. He said, how could something so beautiful be mine? And they told him, they said, do you remember that time? that you were eating your food and a poor man came and he was so hungry and he asked you to feed him and you cut half of what you had and you pushed it and you gave it to him. You gave him half. He said, I gave him half and this is what Allah has prepared for me. And then he come back in the world and say, yeah, later the came and I wanted I have given him all of it. And then he goes back out. He sees another piece of Jannah. He says, man, whose is this? The angels tell him, 
They said, do you remember the time when a person wanted to go to the master but he couldn't walk? 